All right, so I got a feeling people are going to keep, well, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm a big mouth. I, I don't even need this. The last two talks, I haven't even used it, but this way it's recorded. All right, so good afternoon now, Gurkhan, it is afternoon. Holy, you, you've made it this far. Everybody in this room, I'm guessing, already ate lunch because everybody else who isn't here is out there eating lunch. That's our story. We're sticking to it. All right, a couple housekeeping things. Don't block the fire exits. I think we're okay right now. Um, cell phones, turn them off. Silence, you know the drill. I wore boots today specifically for this purpose. Don't make me come out there and use them on you. All right, they're almost awake. We, we, we're getting there. All right, so we are talking blinky badges. All the cool stuff. Anybody's ever wanted to make one of their own or you're just curious what the heck goes into making these awesome little toys we get at cons and everywhere else. Hey, Dave Schwartzberg's here. He's going to talk to you all about it. So with that, Dave, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. So if you haven't eaten yet, thank you for uh, going through the, the hunger pains. I feel you. I haven't eaten yet either. It's good for you, though, to fast a little bit, and then we can party after this. So. I'm here before you today to talk about some stuff that I've been working on over the past few years. Uh, I've helped participate in making about five different badges, whether I'm designing or I'm kind of just sitting there and watching people and learning and, and any combination thereof. So who in the room actually has sat down and said, I'm going to make a badge and made the badge and finished it? One person? You did? I, I, yeah, I know you did, Phil. Uh, <laughs> so you did? And was it like the easiest thing you've ever done? Oh, hell no, right? So that's really kind of part of this talk. So there's so many different components, so many different facets of things that are going on into this process that um, when I'm having these conversations with other fellow makers, you know, they're kind of, hey, you know, other people want to do this too, but they kind of really don't know where to begin or they have these great ideas and they're not capable to write code or whatever their personal hurdles might be. And I, it just seemed like it made sense to kind of talk about this. So this way, if you are one of those people, hopefully after this talk, except for that gentleman who's leaving, is inspired to continue with the process or maybe get started with one or, you know, reach out to other people that might have the skills that you're, you're, you need help with. Thank you for joining. So first off, uh, my name is up there. It is not pronounced heel wans. Uh, you know, the name comes from my childhood playing Dungeons and Dragons and to the extent of my creativity. Uh, this is the concatenated version of the name to accommodate AOL Neverwinter Nights, but this is the name that I originally gave myself. Again, limited creativity at the age of 14. I played a cleric, but for shorthand reasons, I just go by heel at these events. My Real name is Dave Schwartzberg. It's no secret. Uh, I work for Cisco Systems as a technical solutions architect. And yes, that is just about more fun than it sounds, getting to play with all of Cisco's security tools, including Duo Wolf. What's up, buddy? Uh, so it's a great job, a lot of fun. And um, I have Cisco on the slides because they support my speaking at events to folks like yourselves. Let's talk a little history first. So when uh, this whole badge life kind of craze that's been going on for the past few years, where did it come from? So on the very, very far left, you see the badge that Dro Joe Graham put together for DEF CON 14, 2006. Anybody want to call me out on that? I think it's 2005. OK, my facts are wrong, or you are. Um, but one of those two are correct. So 2006, 2005. Joe Grant comes out with this badge with this kind of idea of uh, wanting people to get excited about doing some kind of hardware hacking, right? So they put some blinky lights on the badge, some other components so you can do some other fun stuff. Very simple, but also very effective because over time, this kind of little spark that got fl um, flame or fl fanned turns into this big, you know, burning sort of dumpster fire, but not dumpster fire, depending on your perspective which is, again, why I have the controversial stuff on this talk at the end. Um, then 
Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with DC Darknet and Smitty Halibut. So the badges to the right, starting with the yellow ones, Smitty uh, read these books called um, Demon or Damon, however you want to pronounce it. And in there is a dark net. And he came up with this fun idea of making these little yellow badges and kind of left them around the hardware hacking village. And it was your way into the dark net. He made about 100 of them, didn't realize what he did, but he got a lot of people really excited about the kind of custom hardware and getting involved with hardware hacking. And that kind of, again, springboarded into the next version, um, you know, so on and so forth. They created more. This is a picture he took for me because I couldn't find the older versions. I found the newer ones, but I was like, do you got any old photos? And he went on and told me the whole story, which then turned into some brief memoirs that he put in like a Twitch stream so or tweet stream or on Twitter. So if you look for it, you could see like the history of what he was creating and what he was trying to do. But it's a fun kind of thing, but really turned into also again with Joe Grand into what we call today is badge life. So these are it's a close up of the one of these badges. Uh, I pretty much have just about all the Darknet badges except the first one. They're really cool. Um, if you can get your hands on some of the older ones, uh, put them together yourself. They're really meant to like get people excited about wanting to do hardware hacking. And, and it did for me. So the one on the le uh, the middle in this picture was the one, uh, the first one that I was able to get. And back like when I was like 18, out of high school, I'm like, I want to become an electrical engineer so I can fix DVD players. That is my future. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't funny back then, sir. It was quite serious. So after a couple years of that, and then really like design's probably a better place to go and then said, heck with that, I'm going to become an accountant and eventually got into IT and now information security. So that's kind of like the past 30 years of my life or so in a very brief, like one sentence. But the point is that badge kind of like rekindled that my passion for tech and hardware. So doing that one thing and kind of like taking me back to when I was a teenager and I think that was maybe five years ago, six years ago. Yeah, I think it was like six years ago. It's kind of funny how these little things can then take you somewhere else that you had no idea where you were going to go. And that's where I'm going with this. And here's some links. Um, so quick, kind of like the, the cool wall. Um, so this is, uh, so anyone see this tweet? Anyone know whose wall this is? Yes, sciatic nerd. Perfect. And how do you know that, sir? <laughs> I actually tested this presentation out on him. <laughs> so thank you for that, Steve. So yeah, so Jason collects these badges. He's like, you know, Mr. DEF CON. So he wants to collect these badges, support the community. Um, here's some of our creations. You can see the arrows we've created. Uh, one badge that was like a cipher disk. They're over at our, our table there in the exhibitor hall. One, one badge uh, we created was a card game, so going analog, so two different kinds of analog badges. Do your badges need to be digital? No. You could still make a really cool badge that's not digital, that's analog. And, and people will still love it. You know, you can't, you don't have to be, you know, within like the herd. Think differently, be different. Uh, and I got some other like wisdom, pieces of wisdom for you later. But there's in the, the red box is the current badge. Uh, that's the kids badge and uh, here's the, uh, organizer's badge in front. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you're not too familiar with badge life culture, one of the things that we do every year is we do have like a meetup, we get together, kind of swap badges, sell badges, talk about like how we designed it and stuff. And then somebody takes a picture and you might see it in like Hackaday or something like that. So, or, so if you go to Hackaday, you'll see, I think this, this photo or like kind of like a bird's eye view, almost like a fisheye lens on it. And we are right here in the corner. <laughs> we just kind of put it down, walked away. But yeah, it was kind of cool that we're like right there with all those other fantastic and amazing and fun designs. It, it's not rocket science, people. Um, this is something that, I, again, depending on your level of education and your tenacity and you know your real hacker mentality, is, is this something for everybody? I think it's possible. I didn't think I'd be standing here today talking to you about some badges that we created uh, for the, the events this year and some other things, but it was it's just like anything else. If you really put your mind to it, you're going to be able to do it. 
you've got to have the passion that helps you with the drive. But also when you have limitations, like, um, I could kind of write code. I don't think of myself as a developer, but I wrote the code on the badge twice. So according to my friend, I guess I'm now a developer, but I don't, I necessarily agree with that. But I kind of had some skills from earlier in my education, which I then use like almost 30 years later because I had the foundational knowledge. It's just kind of learning and pushing yourself and, and then doing what you need to do to get it done. Basically don't quit, right? There is a way to get there. So personal like kind of message to you on this is um, even if you like, oh, you know, I have this creative juices and I really don't know what to do with them. Talk to somebody, talk to somebody who's done it they can help you get started. And that's kind of also what this talk is for. Kind of whoever can't be here today or is having lunch, kind of help you guys get a little bit more motivated and inspired to move forward. Now, part of the, like what Joe Grand was doing, um, if you went to DEF CON this year and you went to his opening badge talk and how it was really important to get more and more people into hardware hacking, uh, you know, these are some of the reasons, right? Um, so here's uh, one type of a hardware ha attack. It doesn't say there. Does anybody know which one this is? You might get this. All right. It's Rowhammer. So it's a little older, but it's kind of like some of the things that came out were like, yeah, now hardware is being attacked pretty much more frequently. Um, I think you'll know this one because of the iconography, like meltdown. But those are the links to the papers if you want to read them. They're actually pretty interesting. No, I did not read them, them in entirety, but I kind of skimmed through it and was like, wow, these people are really smart. And I wish I was, but that's the point. You teach yourself, you keep going forward, you never stop. So let's look at this badge really quick. Um, kind of now we kind of covered some history and, and some other problems. So the Tyro badge that was created. So at Hack for Kids, we've got the kids, they're known as Tyros, like they're learning. That's what that word means. The chaperones we call pones, a little fun thing for us. Uh, the volunteers we call admins, and the organizers called the badges just called leet instead of Uber. Somebody did that. I didn't name these things. Um, so I don't think of myself as leet. That's why I'm saying that. So the Tyro badge for the kids and for the adults is, is the white one, the admin is red, and the organizer badge, which is what I like to call it, is, uh, is the black one. So that's the one you see here. And here's the Tyro badge or the board. Now, there's not any real difference on them. So the event that we did in Chicago this year, I did make them a little different to put different puzzles. And it's kind of easier when you have like a couple badges and that kind of makes it fun. So if you're designing something where people are interacting with people with badges, um, the colorization of the badge does help tremendously because then people kind of know who to go to or who not to go to if they've already done something versus having badges that scroll something and you're like, did I get that? Did I get that? And it just makes things a little bit more clunky and awkward, awkward for people if you're going to turn it into a puzzle or challenge. So, um, but the, the new version of the badge, or I call it like the DEF CON version of the badge, is really for just about anyone and anything. And it has a virtual escape room on it, which is really pretty cool. So we had an actual physical escape room at Hack for Kids this year, which had them have to apply the different things that they learn usually at an event. So like if you've done lock picking here, they do lock picking at a Hack for Kids or they will do that tomorrow. Um, if they're also, you do anything with maybe uh, electrical engineering, right? Snap circuits, they had to assemble a radio. So kind of like hidden or locked away in one part of the room was a schematic. And then another part were pieces. And then they eventually had to figure out, oh, I need to build this. And when they build this, they're listening to a broadcast coming from a, a Raspberry Pi, which had instructions for another part of the puzzle. So lots of layers, applying the skills, a lot of fun stuff. And they had 25 minutes. Um, there were some crypto puzzles too. There was a suitcase that was locked that they had to kind of get through. Um, and only one team finished it, which some of them got close, but maybe we made it a little too hard, or maybe we need to focus more on teaching them the skills. But they all had fun, and that's the big part of it is having fun. So that's the badges. Um, so the badges has some other fun features. If you want to see one or play with one, we still have some over there in the exhibitor hall. You can kind of check it out. It's got Pong running. I don't know if it's still running now, but I have found a demo of Pong, which old video game on new hardware. That's really kind of fun. Um, the hardware is also, I don't know if you guys are familiar, like an ESP32. I don't, 
I wasn't planning on getting too deep into the hardware, but we have so many different LED um, uh, like IO ports so that we had or, or pins, we, we had to put like an LED driver. So we go from the ESP to the LED driver to the lights. So that, that tends to be a little complicated if you're new to this thing. But we also have um, just regular plain old like monochrome, like red and white lights. So that's a lot easier to get to. But it's a fun thing, built in Wi-Fi, built in Bluetooth, a lot of fun stuff uh, to do just if you want to kind of get started. So for the kids, it's kind of like they can leave it as is or they can go to GitHub and look at the code and learn and then completely wipe it and make it their own. And that was really the intent. So when they leave, they had some kind of hacking platform for them in addition to the fun game. Uh, so kind of explained this part already, part of the next generation. It's really important for us to get um, youths and, and even adults exposed to these things. So kind of get their passion going and their fires fanned, just like I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, if somebody is doing this for, and here's the Pikachu. Uh, so Twinkle Twinkie, who uh, he's, he's a part of Badge Life and what he's really big is the artistic part of creating the add-ons or their SAOs. Special add-ons, as a kid present, I'm not gonna use the other uh, official word, but it's a special add-on or SAO. And he really does some amazing things with the different um, substrates and uh, avoiding things like uh, light diffusion or controlling light, like this particular add-on. This It's kind of probably hard to see. This GIF add-on, when it's illuminated, you know, the, the earlier versions, there was light bleed into different areas, and he didn't want that. So I think he went with three a three-layer board with some copper in between to control the light bleed. And if I apologize, if it's a four layer, somebody will correct me, put it in the, the comments or the notes to say, you know, fool, it's four layers, not three or vice versa. I forgot, I, I had a couple drinks last night, but those brain cells are now dead. But this is really cool. And this kind of shows you his passion about making the electronics um, do what he wants them to do from a visual standpoint, right? So it doesn't have to be a badge that you could serial in and have a whole virtual world that you can kind of go and hack into. It could be something that's just visually appealing. Like my next design, I'm thinking something that's much more visual and maybe using like an accelerometer, which would be kind of fun. So that's, that's that. Um, the other things, <laughs> see if I can get this to work. So we got Captain Kirk, so that's there on the badge. This is the phaser. So this was the prototype of the phaser. It used red LED, but I wanted it to be a blue LED to match the actual phaser from the series of the, if you watch Star Trek back in like, you know, in the 70s, it was blue, but you couldn't get blue LEDs back there, bless you. But your boards were that color green, right? So I went with the nostalgic green, but with the new blue, uh, board, the new blue LEDs, which you can see down here. And then, you know, the fun one with Pong and what you have before you. So this is more for the benefit of the people on the video, kind of see the video of what you guys see physically in front of you. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's that feeling of just doing the Captain Kirk face and finding a picture of him and putting it into GIMP. And I'll talk more about the tools and cleaning it up and then making it black and white and then putting it into ink screen and then trying to get it vectorized, right, from raster graphics to vector graphics, and then putting it into KiCad and doing all of that, it's a lot of steps. And yeah, it could be frustrating, and there's a lot of tools to learn, but when you complete your project, that feeling of um, self-accomplishment and how, how, proud and the, how proud you feel of just kind of getting over those knowledge hurdles of, you know, where before, like I never used KiCad, like that was the first thing I've ever created in KiCad was the Kirk. Face. I was using other tools um, like fritzing, but the Kirk head, um, simple blinky eyes, but at the same time, it's kind of like that coming of age. And then now I could do more because I've, I've overcome that first obstacle. So, oh, here, I keep it blinking, I'm moving on. So where do we go from here? Okay, so now that we've kind of laid the foundation of what you could do and where you are mentally with the entire process, um, how do you go forward and actually do this? Now, you know, hats off to anyone who started it. Even if you haven't finished it, you started it. And, and that's really an important thing too, because just getting something started, you can find people that would help you finish. Uh, you know, this, this badge, I had somebody help me do the electrical engineering design. Um, great guy. The one, the guy, he created the goon badge, the goon box badge I'm actually wearing. 
CompuKid Mike, thank you. I was actually thinking of his company named MK Factor, which is on it, but yes, thank you, CompuKid Mike. Um, great work, great person to work with, and he helped us with the electrical engineering, and I kind of worked on the other stuff, and I'll get to that a little bit more. But you need to figure out, like, what level of quality do you want? Uh, you need to know not just, okay, we're going to start, but when do we need to start? you got to look at your project and kind of go backwards. I'm going to get into these in a bit more depth. I'll get to that later. Um, you know, why are you doing this? What is your purpose? What is your end goal? If you're just saying, well, I don't know, I just want to make something, you got to think about it a little bit more. Uh, again, I mentioned some tools, but you've got to find tools that you're comfortable with. But sometimes, like when I was going to go and learn fritzing in the Badge Life Slack channel, they're like, no, no, no. Go and learn KiCad. You'll, you'll, you'll realize that you know, there's a steeper learning curve, but later on, you'll really appreciate it. And I listen to them, and, and I see that now. Um, and also, how is this going to be funded? Stuff's not that inexpensive. Like little, little things, smaller things, you could print up, or I'll just speak specifically, the, the phaser, I think when it was all said and done, probably cost us around three or $400 to produce about 50, which doesn't really sound that expensive. I mean, but you could still kind of buy a laptop nowadays for about that much money. So from an electronic standpoint, it sounds pretty expensive. You got to decide, you know, what you're willing to spend. So when you pick your team, who do you want on your team? The guy with the right hook or the one receiving the right hook? Sometimes you might be the one receiving the right hook, but don't let that get you down. I got a better laugh at this in Canada with these Toronto teams. I wonder why. I guess I got to know my audience a little better. <laughs> Maybe we should have some Michigan teams up there. So who do you want to have on your team? You know, you want to get the heavy hitters, but if you're thinking like, I want that and or team, I know they're going to help me. That's a team of five and they're all super busy and some of them, I think, own a business. It's going to be hard. But then you also don't want somebody who's like, I apologize if this offends anyone. Well, I've never really done this before, and I want to get started, and I want to do it. Because then they're going to be slow to start, and you're going to be relying on them, but they really aren't too sure what to do. Find someone in the middle. I'm kind of like that guy. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm like past the, well, I wasn't really sure how to do this. So our first electronic badge, somebody did it. I kind of gave him the art told him what we wanted, and he did a lot of the work, and I learned from him. But the other badges, a lot of that was me, except for this one. Um, you gotta dedicate the time, too. You gotta take the time to do this. So find your team, communicate, set up a way that you could talk on a regular cadence. It's incredibly important to keep the communication going. Um, I'll move on from there. You're also, level of quality, Scope creep is a huge problem when it comes to these things. And you probably heard this before. Yes, my puns are koala tea. Uh, when you say, like, here's the 10 features we want, but here's the three features we must have, you know, you've got to focus on the must have first. Because as I'm like, eh, we're going to do Wi Fi, and we can do auto updating on the badge, and we can do all these other really fun and cool things. But if we don't get what the core purpose of the badge is done first, then you have nothing, right? And, and I look at it as the, what motivates me, which pushes me is I feel responsible to the recipients of the badge. So the person that has the badge, I feel like I'm obligated to give them a good experience. Is it the best experience they'll ever have? I can try for that, but I know I'm not that good. I realize that. But I want them to learn. I want them to have fun, and I want them to have like a takeaway. And that's my responsibility, my obligation. So I say, we got to do that first. All the other cool things, all the other fun things, that's going to have to come later. And you got to have that same mindset of, you could build it for you, but you might be the only one who appreciates it. I'm building these for you guys. And that's my mentality when it comes to this. So I, I recommend that as well. Now, getting started, like you kind of sit down, you define you know, your features and everything. And you kind of like where to begin. And it could be like a really long winding road. Um, this is like in some mountain range, I think in Germany or somewhere in that part of the, the world. And, and you might just feel like you're going back and forth. But you've got to have time milestones. Some of this might sound like basic project management because it kind of really is. But you don't want to just talk about features and get yourself excited and get other people excited and then never start. Um, and sometimes you need to look at when you're going to start something, when do you need to have it ready by? And if you don't know what the road at the very end looks like, getting started in that road 
it's just going to be kind of like, it, it doesn't really exist, at least in my opinion. So when you say like this badge had to be done, it was by like May 1st, I said, because our event was May 18th and we needed time to flash them. When you're flashing about two or 300 badges, it takes time. It could take four or five minutes or more. You can run into problems. You might run into a hardware issue. Do I want to sit there and troubleshoot the hard issue or throw it to the side, put a little marking on it on a piece of paper and say, I'll get to that issue later. You know, LED, uh, display, whatever it might be. And just keep going forward and going forward and going forward. So you need to have that date when you absolutely need to have stuff done by. Add two weeks. And then at every other point where you have features or it's kind of like a milestone step, figure out how much time you think you're going to need. And then once you've added all that together, just add on an extra month. And if anything slips, because it will, uh, then you have a window, you've baked in a window. But if you're like, well, we think this will take three months, so we're going to get started three months before when we actually have it, you will not be ready on time. Um, one person in badge life, and it was their first badge they created. It was a young man. I'm not going to name him, um, but he's a great guy and everything. And not, not I don't want to name him just because it was unnecessary. Uh, he, he worked on a project and he did it pretty much all himself, but he got the badges stuck in, in customs of China. Uh, they never showed up on time for DEF CON. I was one of the people that backed his Kickstarter. So I was like really excited to have it at DEF CON. And then they showed up at my doorstep two months later after DEF CON. Now, I say, you know, stuff happens. Uh, I think, uh, and, you know, if he's watching this, I'm not being judgy, but he may be put a little too much on himself. I, you know, but I also hats off to that because it's a big project. You know, a lot of things happen and you need to be flexible. You need to have the time. And, you know, it's a lesson learned for him, but he, he produced it. He finished it. There are some people, unfortunately, they could not finish the badges. And sometimes people um, made comments publicly. The badge life people are not trying to have you, you know, support them and then not deliver. Things happen. So when you, you know, decide to get it funded through a Kickstarter or a Tindy or something, think about how the recipient feels if they don't have it and you really want to make sure that you deliver, which is kind of a slide I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Delivery is incredibly important. But you got to bake in the time. That's kind of the message here. Bake in enough time. We had issues um, with this board, yeah, another personal story. With this one, um, trying to set up the prototype, it would take me, I had three prototype boards, it would take me four hours just to get one soldered up. And then um, I had bridging, which is when your solder kind of connects, and some other issues. And with the ESP32, it was like bridging under the chip. So I couldn't like see under there and trying to remove it, you, you destroy the substrate. So I kind of had one left. I sent it to CompuKid Mike. He looked at it and he goes, oh, look, you're not like connecting. I'm like, how do you see that? He goes, well, I'm using a microscope. I was using a magnifying glass. I got 50 year old eyes, so I couldn't see that stuff. Guess what I did? I bought a microscope, $135 investment, and I use it all the time. I feel like I have Superman vision now because I just set it to my focus, not like with the glasses on, and I see everything. So little things like that can make a huge difference, but we lost time. He found errors on the board. I already gave the, the approval to start producing the boards in China. Never do that. Uh, you want to make sure your prototype's working because we were running out of time. And uh, I was able to stop what they were doing in China in time to like, they saved like the materials and then they were able to fix one of the two physical errors that we had. Like, yeah, I mean, that's a lesson learned for me. But again, I was trying to stick to my timelines. You got to figure out, you know, you want to take that risk. It could have been a very expensive risk, but I wanted to make sure that we had things moving along. Again, going back to why are you doing this? What are your objectives? Try not to over-engineer. I think I'm spending way too much time on some of these slides. I'm going to go a little faster. Try not to wait. Oh, I mean, I love um, Rube Goldberg machines. I think they're hilarious. I've built a few, but your badge should not be one. Uh, simplicity is definitely key and usability. If it's just in your mind, you're like, yeah, I'm going to have all these buttons and I want to do all this other stuff. For you, it might be easy to use, but for other people, they're going to look at it and they'll sigh inside and say, I have no idea what to do with this thing. Yeah, it looks cool, but I can't. Because um, you've, you've kind of put it to a position where now it, it, you set the bar too high. 
But if that's your objective, then that's fine. If that is your objective, just try not to over-engineer it. Tools that you could use, um, some people use paint, because you can create a nice vectorized bitmap with paint. Go for it if that's what you want to use. Some people use Adobe. I tend to go with things like GIMP and um, InkScreen. Uh, Fritzing is another interesting tool. Uh, a lot of stuff in like the Adafruit website, if you see like the graphics with the lines and the different colors that are wires, that's like Fritzing, which is great for somebody to learn. But if you actually want to produce something that you want to have like the different colored solder mask and the silk and have a different colored substrate and maybe even have exposed copper, it's harder to do that with Fritzing uh, than, than it would be with KiCad. But again, KiCad has a steeper learning curve because it has so many capabilities. And then you just produce your Gerbers, send them Gerber files are the files that you give the people that make the board so they, they understand where things go and um, where to cut it and drill it and other, other really important things. Um, there's also Eagle. Eagle's been around a long time. It's also now another popular one that people use. I just wanted to put that up there. How are you going to get it paid for? Well, find sponsors. Gurkhan, right here. Right here. CypherCon, also right on the side. It's, there's no, um, I'm going to say there's no shame, but I don't even think it's shame. If you don't have the money to do this and you know you're having an event or something, it's okay to ask other people because they re might really want to support your mission, your cause, and they might want to be a part of your creation. I know, for example, like CG Silvers, he loves the fact that we have his logo on the badge, and we were able to do that because we have a big display, but if you don't have a display or you know, it may not work out for you because of the real estate reasons, find a way to get sponsors to help. Um, one person, uh, Johnny Christmas, gave me something like really good advice was we were at CypherCon, he's like, your display is so big, in your Kickstarter, you should put something so that sponsors can like, sign up right there at the Kickstarter. Our Kickstarter, we had $3,000 in sponsor money alone yeah so it, it pays and it's it absolutely it was a great suggestion thank you again Johnny and um, it works out uh, how you want to sell them kind of up to you right you can go to Shopify we use that online you could sell them on Tindy a lot of the makers also love to go to Tindy because that's where the buyers are right um, they're also on Kickstarter but how do they know when you're on Kickstarter you got to use social media you got to get out there so I'm gonna move on I have more to talk about this but I'm gonna jump ahead now that you kind of, you know, you're, you're thinking about what you want to do and get started, now you've got to work on your circuit board design. How are you going to do assembly? And then who's going to do the coding if it's not you? So let's get into that a little deeper. So this is the schematic for this board. And again, it's up on GitHub. Um, again, thank you, CompuKid Mike. So you need somebody that understands how all these things connect together. So you want to figure out, like, what tool you're going to use for the circuit board design, right? So if you said, okay, we're going to use KiCad, great. So now you, you go forward and, and what's it going to do? Like when you had your specs before and said we needed to do these three things, is it going to be a chip like an ESP32 or is it going to be separate chips like separate Wi-Fi controllers, separate like Bluetooth or Zigbee or XB or something? You've got to figure out what those components are. And that's kind of the stage right here is before you could connect the things, what parts are you going to use? Uh, and then on the right here is also the... Um, um, like kind of the layout of the board. So it's a zoom in of the forearm, where I call it the arm pad, where we had some LEDs behind that as well. And you can kind of see where the traces go, where the silk screen is going to be. You guys know what the silk screen is, right? And the solder mask, all that stuff. So get your board design and set up, like again, how much time do you think you need to do the board design? If someone's like, if it's really super complicated and it's going to take, oh, I'll get it done in two weeks. Like, is that realistic? Maybe say, take three, take four, but maybe no more than four. You really got to kind of set up the boundaries on this. Uh, also in assembly and production, um, I wanted to go local. Now, I wanted to start to build a relationship with somebody. I live in the Chicago suburbs. These guys, Accelerate Assemblies, are in Elk Grove Village. I like the idea of when I had the, the parts, I could drive them over. Why? It saves me time. Wait, but you're doing it right. But if I go to ship it, I could ship it overnight and it costs a lot of money. But if I ship it regular, maybe two day, that's two days of time lost. Well, then just plan ahead. Sometimes things don't always work that way. So 
uh, when, when you heard about the tariffs going up with the components, I bought a lot of parts before the beginning of the new year to save about 25% of the cost because of the tariffs. So I had, I don't know, I think it was like $4,000 worth of parts like sitting in my house until we were ready to get to assembly. And my wife's like, what are we going to do with this stuff? And I'm like, well, we'll get there. You'll see. Um, but when we got there and she's like, oh, I get it now because she's not very technical, but uh, she, she kind of like, you know, she's a very good support of, of these crazy things that I like to do. But Accelerated Assembly, I also got to check out their facility. So if you're going like one of the other companies at a remote, you don't get to see like solder waves. Like they had this uh, in there, this giant machine with molten solder. So the boards kind of go over it and it gets like bathed in solder and it comes. No one else thinks that's cool. It's like molten solder, not just like a drop, like an ocean of it. I mean, it was really cool. And you get to see the pick and place machine, which is like up there. Like it's just these robotic arms moving super fast, grabbing and putting everything accurately. And then after having spent over four hours trying to do this by hand, you appreciate the assembly. Another thing to think about, how are you going to do the assembly? If it's a small quantity, maybe you could do it by hand. But if it's a high quantity, you're going to have to say, well, we might have to just pay the extra little bit of money to save the time. And this was another time saving thing, you know, cost benefit analysis. You got to weigh it in. But I, like I said, I want to build a relationship. Um, that picture is just a picture to show you like you could be sitting there and soldering it yourself. So when you're writing the code, what platform do you want to use? If you're, you're, you, know, you like Eclipse and you're comfortable with that IDE, go for it. Uh, you could write all your code in like C++ or you can write it in maybe Python. There's like MicroPython and other, other tools and platforms you could use. I went with what I knew, Arduino IDE, and it worked well with this chip. Right? So it kind of made sense for me. And it was easy because if I made a change, I could just flash it again, flash it again, flash it again. Um, or you could just use a text editor and then they, they typically... Whoever makes a chip typically has some kind of tools, or there might be some open source tool where you can then, after you've compiled your bytecode, then write it to the chip. Sometimes it requires assembly language. It's kind of a dying art. Who here, here still writes code in assembly language? Right. You, I, I'm not surprised it's you, Phil. Um, who could read assembly language? Sort of. But who wants to sit down and like JMP, and then I don't know where we're going to go from there. It's just. Wherever, wherever we need to go. Um, now, once you've got your, your badge and you've got your timelines, you've got to start working on also thinking about how you're going to promote it. And you could use social media. There's different options there, of course. We'll get into that. Um, keeping track of your expenses. So my original, so I started when I was 18 in electrical engineering. Then I went to school for accounting. So I'm really kind of an accountant that's a techie nerd that then said accounting's for the birds. I'm now going to go in, into technology full time. So fortunately, I have that training. There are some people who are brilliant in technology, but they don't get like, you know, debit is left, credit is right, and when something goes in, something comes out. It has to always balance. And if you don't know where it goes, it goes somewhere. You just got to figure out where it goes, maybe retained earnings or owner equity. So having somebody like, you know, you don't need an accountant, but just the bookkeeping, tremendously important. Because if it's a hobby that starts to turn into something where you become profitable, you need to figure out, like, am I going to have to pay taxes on this? I may. So I really need good accounting because I don't want to pay more taxes than I need. And then delivery, another one. I gave you one delivery example. Uh, I can go on with more, but um, I, I did hear a story of a friend who had, I think, three badges. You know who the friend is. Um, I had, who had three badges or so, and they, that just got lost. Like, they were delivered. They weren't there when he showed up. And some of the makers were really cool because they had extras and they were able to replace it. But others are like, I'm sorry, they're all gone. There's nothing I can do, right? So there is a risk from the buy side as well as from somebody who's building a badge. Kind of covered a lot of this stuff, right? Social media, you guys know to use it. Kickstarter is good. Selling on Tindy also helps. But promoting that badge, incredibly important because once you have something, what you want to do is if you're planning to sell them to raise money to support your cause or you just want to have them because you're going to you know, give them to people like kids or something. But you want people to know about it. You want people to be excited about it. And one person that I think did a really fantastic job with promoting it is if you guys saw the, um, uh, the multi-pass badge, the fifth element, he was 
building his prototype and taking like really kind of close up shots and putting them out on Twitter and social media and saying, hey, here's something that I'm working on. And people are like, ooh, that looks cool. What are you doing? And then when he released it, uh, I think his Kickstarter was done in like, what, 12 hours? <laughs> 12 hours, hit his goal and was like, I'm done. That is pretty awesome. Um, so hats off to him. Cromulin B is his handle. So hats off to him. Like He, he did a really good job with that. Uh, accounting. Use the tools that work for you. Uh, you can use QuickBooks, which I have. If you really want to get into it, it kind of gets a little expensive. Zoho Books, a little less expensive, but it's online. It's cloud-based. Um, I mean, QuickBooks is also has a, an online version as well. Kind of go with what works for you. If, if you're looking for something that's simple, Zoho Books is pretty good. If you're like, you know, I don't have any money for any of this, you can go to some, you know, office supply store and buy some columnar pads and just kind of like write it down. Purchases for X and then the you know, cash is deducted and assets or whatever you're going to put it to is now increased. You do it manually, but keep good records. When you come to the delivery, um, you know, this was the Canadian Post one, but yeah, uh, so again, know your audience. I forgot to change the mailbox. You could just send it off regular mail which is one thing that we did. You want to deliver. You want to be able to, whether you're delivering in person or you're shipping it through, you know, Amazon Prime Air or however you're getting it to them. I gave you a couple of stories already. If you're not going to deliver, what's going to unfortunately happen is you're going to have people that are not going to trust you in the more, anymore. So people might love your work, but if you can't get it to them, they're never, ever going to come back to you. So very, very important. Or they might even trash talk you on the internet, you know, on some social media site or something. And you don't want that either because now you got to go through that mess. And sometimes it's just easy to refund the money to people. Bless you. Sometimes it's just like, here, here's your money back. I'm not trying to rob you. Just trying to pay for this fun thing I'm trying to do. No harm, no foul. Let's make it right. Right? Take the high road. Post-production. Um, I got a few minutes left. I'm going to come a little faster, but I think we've covered most of this, which is really good. So, uh, when you reflect, bring your team together. Maybe if you want, do a survey, like a survey monkey or something, with your, your, your people who like, supported your Kickstarter or however they may have bought it. Just say, what did you think? What worked for you? What didn't work? What would you have liked to have seen? Um, one of the weird things that I get is with the badge, because it had like a little film on it. And so many times people are like, my badge is broken. There's a line here. I'm like, well, no, that's a line to let you know that there's a tab you can remove. So maybe a little like, better usability and, and how I'm like kind of delivering it to people and just let them know. By the way, there's a tab here you need to remove. Your, your display is not broken. Or, or just little things like that can also, when, they're, when you're asking them for feedback, it certainly shows that you care and that you are trying to make things better and, and the experience is for them, right? Like we said before. Um, you're gonna have some damaged goods. Um, things are just sometimes, I mean, it's electronic. Sometimes they don't just solder up right. I've seen some things while I was flashing and testing. Some LEDs, they just did not go on. Am I gonna take the time to sit there with the microscope and try and figure it out and reflow and, and reposition? Uh, if you got a short time frame, like a deadline is, is looming and coming up on you quickly, that's not the best use of your time. So when everything's done, like when after Gurkhan's done and I kind of get all the accounting and everything cleaned up, I'm going to be sitting down and looking at the 20 some odd badges that had some issue somewhere, couldn't flash, it's the USB, whatever it is, take them apart a little bit and then try again and see if they could be usable. Because at the end of the day, like I don't want to keep all these, I want to keep a couple, but I really don't want to have like, you know, 50 badges sitting in my garage for the next 10 years. It, it doesn't serve a purpose. I want it in the hands of somebody who's going to learn from using it. And then when you're done, like part of the reflection, think about like, Next project, are we gonna have a next project? Was this painful? Was it painful? Did you do another project afterwards? Trying to, it's great, right? So you decided, okay, it's kind of like type two fun. You guys are familiar with type one, type two fun. Type one fun is fun in the moment, like right now that you're having, listening to my talk. Type two fun is when you leave and you think about the talk, you're like, man, that was a really good talk. Or building a badge, when you're done, you're like, you know, it kind of, kind of hurt some way along the process, but you know, at the end, I really feel good about it, right? And I really want to do it again. That was actually kind of fun. Um, so some people like, you know, boxing, you know, in the ring, it's not type one fun, but when you win, it's type two fun. So things like that. 
So think about that next project. Again, in your feedback survey from your, your customers or your, your people using the badge, ask them, what would you have liked to have seen? Like, what could have been something that would have maybe taken this badge to the next level? Or would you want like less visual, more visual, more challenges, less challenges, more visual, whatever it is, because again, you're making it for them. So think about that next project. And then in a realistic time frame, how much more time do we have? Five minutes? Okay, I'm nearly done. Um, when you're thinking about that next project, also think about like, when is it a good time to start? I've already started thinking about my next projects and one, I want to make more visual. And I think I mentioned it before with like an accelerometer and some graphics and we could see if we can do that. Uh, I also want to make some others that can do other different things. You know, I'm not going to talk about it just yet, but you want to keep, keep doing this. Um, one of the things I just kind of forgot to mention, when you are doing these projects and you are thinking about your next one, who are you competing with? yourself. If you're like, you know, and not XOR, they make beautiful, educational, wonderful badges, but it's a team of five. And if it's you and maybe one other person, you can't really compete with them. So don't spend your time and your energy doing something like that because you're just going to kind of feel discouraged. Compete with yourself. So look at what you've done and what can you do that you've never done before. So like I've never used an accelerometer, so I think that would actually be kind of fun and then have it change like a graphic or something when, when the badge moves to give it like a 3D effect. We'll see if I can get that, pull that off, but I've never done that. And if I can do that, I'll feel really proud of myself. I know sciatic nerd will feel pretty proud of me too. And I think it might just stop there. Um, but just, you want to have fun and, and just challenge yourself, compete with yourself. Now you're going to, you're going to get some negativity especially if you're going to make it very public and very visual or, or visible to people. Being uh, remaining positive is incredibly important. Um, one, if, if you get start to get discouraged, people are going to pick up on it. And then um, they may or may not have, again, faith in you for your next project. But people like positive people, right? Like who wants to be around like Eeyore all day? Eh, maybe not. It's kind of cute once in a while, but for the most part, no. Uh, so keep positive, you know, make, think of this thing as like your Zen project, something that is, is kind of lifting you up into enlightenment as best as you can. Um, remember to communicate. Um, if you have to communicate here, uh, like Leonidas, I mean, you know, he's like here, his, his team is dead. They're on the ground. He's got a few arrows in his chest. It kind of looks like the end is near, especially if you're doing a Kickstarter, your backers want to know. They want to know what's going on. I think I sent out maybe seven or eight communications just about things because they feel like they're a part of the process. They feel like they're supporting your project, that they should know what's going on, positive or negative. Again, I said keep it positive, but if like, hey, we're having delays because of something with China customs or we found like a part is not really working and we're kind of re-engineering it, they want to know because they're expecting a deliverable. Again, delivery, and if they see there's a delay, they'll be like, oh, okay, most people are pretty reasonable. You just need to communicate. So to wrap up, two minutes. Uh, I might not really talk about this too much, but somebody brought up like, again, like environmental concerns. You know what? I don't know how this is going to affect the environment, to be honest. But when you think about how many badges we created and all the other electronics that are being created, it's a fairly small footprint um, compared to a global scale. Now, is there some impact? Yeah, but um, I e recycle everything. If it's not going to be like used, I take it to our local e-cycling pump company. Or it's just basically the town hall. Um, but you want to, and there are some companies, but you know, be, be mindful of that. You don't want this stuff sitting in the ground for a couple billion years. Um, so some people bring that up as an issue. It really is not an issue. There's more other, like other stuff that's in the ground that's worse. Um, I think I'll stop here. So um, folks, if you guys have any questions, uh, you could reach me here, heel with hands at hackforkids.com or Hack for Kids Twitter account or my other Twitter account or on Facebook. Uh, I want to thank Cisco again for giving me the opportunity to be here today to speak to you folks. I had fun. I think I had a couple of you nod off. Um, that's okay. The yawning, it's hard to fight that, but I understand it's kind of like around lunchtime, but thank you for being here anyway. And if you guys have questions, you want to check out the badge, I'll go out this door and we can kind of coalesce over there. Does that sound good? Oh, I got to give this away. Mm. 
So who's never, who wants to work with electronics and has never really had like an opportunity to do something with electronics? Let me see your hands. None of you, why are you in this room? <clears throat> Sir, with a hand up, this is yours. All right, well, thank you guys. Take care.